we're going to give you a lot of information today, a lot of science today. So you might want to get a piece of paper and get a pen because we are going to give you a lot of stuff. Now, one of the things that we're going to do in the PDFs that we set you up for, I'm going to give you what I've actually written out for this uh, seminar. So we are going to give you a lot of information. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload the PDF that I actually wrote out to correspond with our talk today. So some of the information will actually be in the, the PDF, but you might want to get, uh, you might want to get a piece of paper and a pencil because what we're going to be dealing with today is the science. Okay. Because we've been told for 40, 50, 60 years that cholesterol is a demon and we've got to worry about this and, and we need to be careful with this kind of stuff. And the science doesn't bear this out. Now, I know we really don't want to know the science. We just want to know the truth. And we're going to just deal a little bit in the science. I cut out an awful lot of the science out of this talk so that we can, uh, we can get through this thing. But so it's 12 o'clock my time. Now, also remember, if you don't live in Tucson or Arizona, I mean, um, we don't do daylight savings time. So we are now Pacific time. I did put that in some of the emails that we sent out reminding you about this, uh, but the um, we are now Pacific time. So in the winter, we're mountain time, and in the summer, we're Pacific time because we just don't play, right? We don't play this uh, daylight savings time. So, all right, here we go. This is going to challenge a lot of things that we have accepted for decades and decades and decades. And uh, what we better start doing as far as health-minded persons is to start actually doing some of our own research and making sure that what we're actually being told is correct, okay? So let me, there we go, okay. So 60% of Americans have a chronic disease. 40% of Americans have two or more. Now, this little graphic here comes from the CDC. Now, this was done a bunch of years ago. Uh, and so they say $3.3 trillion in annual health care costs. But actually, in reality, it's up to $4.7 trillion now. Okay? So we're actually spending more a year on health care now than the budget to run the United States of America. So... Um, I don't know if you guys can see me because I started with the slides, but uh, the lighting is still horrible, but I did order some lights. They came in yesterday. So uh, our next webinar next month, uh, you should be able to actually see me. So we're trying to get with this uh, internet thing. So with 60% of Americans having a chronic disease, life expectancy is declining for the first time in decades. What we offer is customized health plans to get to the cause. Everything is about the cause of the health concerns, not giving you a drug to cover up the symptoms. But what we're interested in is that you can enjoy health and a quality of life that you deserve, okay? So I'm gonna show you a little, uh, little I think it's a three minute movie, movie and it'll really kind of show you a little bit of what we're up against with research and all this kind of stuff. Oh. That's the name of our talk. Sorry, two slides away. So everything you know about cholesterol is wrong. <laughs> oh, you're terrible. can dramatically increase your chance of heart attack. Don't eat eggs. Oh my God. Thank you. You're welcome. Godspeed. Well, I guess I better take those eggs. Wait! Stop! You're back! Yeah. We were wrong about the eggs. How? It turns out there's two types of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and eggs actually have both. 
So you can eat eggs, but just don't eat the egg yolks. So stick with the egg whites. Thank yes, thank you. Godspeed. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so it turns out that the amount of cholesterol in a food doesn't actually affect how much cholesterol ends up in your blood. The eggs are probably fine. In fact, we sort of don't even know what cholesterol is. But the steak! You can't eat the steak! Why not? Turns out that red meat increases your chance of heart attack. You have to cut out red meat, so no steak! Thank you. Godspeed. <laughs> No steak, mister. Wait! We were wrong about the steak. It's the toast. Man was not meant to eat bread. What do you mean, man was not meant to eat bread? Well, if you think about it, human beings should really only be eating what our Paleolithic ancestors ate. So, therefore, no bread, no toast. How do you know what our Paleolithic ancestors ate? Well, we, we just have to guess, right? I mean, we don't have any way of knowing. <sighs> okay, went back to the Paleolithic. They are not doing well. I don't know what we were thinking. If anything, we should all be eating a lot more bread. Jeez. So I guess just um, ignore everything I've said and exercise. Exercise, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you guys could probably use it. You've been just sitting here for the last 35 years. It's been five minutes. Right. Time travel. All right, well, Godspeed. <laughs> genetic. Doesn't matter whether you exercise or what you eat. I'm sorry I ruined your minute. What are you talking about? <clears throat> Do you want some eggs? I'd love some. Okay. So this is what we're up against. And even though that was funny and everything, the rules keep changing. And the sad part is, is we think it's all based in science and a lot of times it isn't. So let me just kind of summarize our cholesterol journey. So in the 1970s, early 70s, mid 70s, we didn't even know what cholesterol was. It wasn't even an issue. And then cholesterol became a big issue at the end of the 70s, like what they showed here. And at the beginning, it was a total cholesterol number of 240, but it was only for a man who'd already had a heart attack or a stroke. Then in the 1980s, I believe it was 1984, we formed the American, uh, let's see, the Coalition, American Coalition of Cholesterol, I think is what it was called. And we lowered the number to 200, and then it was for men or women who had risks of heart attack, but didn't have to have a heart attack or a stroke. And then in the 90s, we lowered it to 180. And then we said in the early 2000s, well, it's not your total cholesterol anymore. Now it's the LDLs and the HDL. And so how we taught it back in the early 2000s was the L, LDLs, nobody could remember which was good, which was bad. And the L for LDL, so that means lousy or lethal. And the H for the HDLs, that means healthy. And so that's how we taught it for a bunch of times. And then now what they're actually saying is that it has nothing to actually most of the LDLs are actually good for you. So the latest is a small particle LDL in combination with a low HDL. So high small particle LDLs in combination with a low HDL. That's what it is now. So and what we're going to do with today is, is some of the science that this whole thing was based on, which now has been almost completely debunked. And that's what we're going to talk about. So it is. It's just like that guy. And then he said at the end, it's genetics. Well, we know that's not true either because of the Human Genome Project. 
So we mapped all the human DNA from the year 1990 to 2010, and we learned that most of our beliefs in genetics were wrong too. So the, you know, the question really comes down to, you know, I know we can only know what we know here, but we're gonna find throughout this talk that a lot of this stuff has been manufactured to support the sale of drugs. And this is sad. This is really, really sad. So what is cholesterol? Cholesterol is a waxy substance found in nearly every cell in your body, and it is essential to good health. It plays a role in hormone production, digestion, and the manufacture of vitamin D following sun exposure. It helps protect your cell membranes. Actually, as we're going to show as we go through this, cholesterol is an, uh, actually an antioxidant. The American Heart Association has now lowered the number to 150, the total number, but which is based on unfounded science, which we're going to talk about. Your total cholesterol, the sum of all the cholesterol in your body, HDL and LDL, is actually not a gauge of your heart disease risk. And when they compute the overall number, it also takes into account triglycerides. So cholesterol is bad for you, right? Well, this is what we've been taught. So cholesterol has long been vilified as a primary cause of cardiovascular disease. Yet numerous studies demonstrating that cholesterol has virtually nothing to do with heart disease. This notion that there is a good and a bad cholesterol is also wrong. LDLs and HDLs, it's not a, those aren't actually even cholesterol. What they are are carriers and transporters of cholesterol. So who has heard the idea of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? That's, you know, and in the Q&A, just say yes if you've heard this, because what we've done is we have now come up with this, well, these are good cholesterol and this is bad cholesterol. And this has permeated everything that we believe about this. And most of us have heard this. Most of us have heard that there is good and bad cholesterol. So can chole cholesterol cannot truly indicate your risk of heart disease. We're going to talk a little bit about what the rest of the world looks at as far as heart health and what we look at. We're the only country in the world that looks at only cholesterol and blood pressure. Not that we need to ignore those, but they're not the major markers of, of of heart attacks, and we're going to show you as we go through this. For the past six decades, we have been warned against eating cholesterol-rich foods, claiming dietary cholesterol promotes arterial plaque formation that leads to heart disease. We now have overwhelming evidence to the contrary, but it takes 20 to 30 years from the time we prove something in research before it makes its way down to your primary care physician. And this is still being promoted. We're going to talk about a, uh, an article that just came out of Harvard about two years ago. And they're still proliferating this entire misnomer that, um, that cholesterol is bad for you. Okay. I mean, this, got, this permeated our food industry. I mean, McDonald's had an egg white McMuffin. You could go to Good Egg uh, and you could get an egg white omelet and, and it was bad. You're not supposed to you're not supposed to eat cholesterol, right? Oh, it's bad. We need to stay away from egg yolks. So, so how did we get this idea that cholesterol is bad for us? I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me get it out of the way. So the first scientific evidence linking trans fats to heart disease and exonerating saturated fats was published in 1957 by the late biochemist Fred Kumaro. Unfortunately, Fred's research was overshadowed by an Ansel Keys who did a seven country study which linked saturated fats to heart disease. Later, when they went back and they reanalyzed the seven country study by Ansel Keys, they found that the data that they were using was completely cherry picked to produce the desired outcome. But when you act, uh, but by then the saturated fat myth had was firmly entrenched in America. Okay, here's another one. I moved to Israel, and when I lived in Israel for uh, for some years, um, guess which country consumes the most calcium in the world? United States of America. But guess which country has the highest incidence of osteoporosis in the world? The United States of America. So we need to kind of re-examine this whole idea that calcium stops osteoporosis. Because if that was true, since we consume the most calcium in the world, shouldn't we have the lowest 
incidence of osteoporosis in the world, but yet we don't, we have the highest. So we need to re-examine some of this research. I'm not against research at all, but we need to make sure that the research is actually telling us what is actually bearing out in years and years and years of actually doing it. We've been taking cholesterol to stave off osteoporosis forever. But the question is, since we have so much, should we go back and re-examine this? So here's the truth. Processed vegetable oils loaded with trans fats and damaged omega-6 fats. This is what's producing the problem, not saturated fats. And we have a lot of science that now shows us true. And we're going to talk about omega-6s and omega-3s and stuff like this. So here's what research now shows. Adults over the age of 60 with higher LDL levels generally live longer. Total cholesterol levels are generally not predictive of the risk of heart disease and may be absent or actually inverse in many studies. Few adults who experience high cholesterol die prematurely. Evidence supporting the use of cholesterol-lowering statin drugs to lower your risk of heart disease are slim to none. It is likely the work of the statin makers at least that's the implied conclusion of a scientific review published in the Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology in 2018. So in 2018, they're going back and actually saying that there's really no proof whatsoever. I'll read you what they actually say, but they're going back to say there's absolutely no proof showing that by statins reducing cholesterol increases your life expectancy. But yeah, you're still hearing this from the doctors all over the place. I mean, I know doctors that believe everybody should just be on statins completely. just doesn't matter. Everybody should. The 2018 review identified significant flaws in the three recent studies published by statin advocates attempting to validate the current dogma. The paper presents substantial evidence that cholesterol, LDL, uh, LDL cholesterol levels are not indications of heart risk at all. Now, this is a study that came out in 2018. Okay, well, it's not a study. They actually went back and looked at all the studies to see what, were these studies actual accurate and were they actually telling us the truth? So let's talk about the danger of statins. Now, for the last couple of decades, I've been treating neuropathy. And we actually are addressing, I don't know if you were here last month, but we're actually addressing the myelin sheath. Well, the myelin sheath is one of the biggest, it is not the biggest, it is the problem with neuropathy. And guess what the myelin sheath is made out of? Fat and cholesterol. So if you take a, uh, Dr. Beatrice Galome, who's a PhD MD researcher at the University of California, San Diego, discovered that 80, this was back in 2002, she discovered that 82% of people that were on statins wound up with neuropathy because the drug was pulling cholesterol out of the myelin sheath, which is what the nerves use to do their function. So the website drugs.com states that there are 35 million people on statins. They often experience a myriad of side effects. Liver damage, for instance, is said to be super rare, implying that ongoing liver tests while taking statins likely aren't necessary at all. Some doctors, however, say you'll need a baseline liver function test before you put you on statins. But that was one of the most smallest uh, side effects of statins was liver problems. The most common side effects of uh, side effects of statins are headaches, muscle pain, lower back pain, side pain, nasal congestion, stuffiness, running nose, difficult sleeping, constipation, hoarseness. And just in case you need a further source, they're now starting to tie cholesterol with psychiatric problems. So in April of 2018, a study found that lowering cholesterol levels in men could bring about changes in nerve cell membranes and behavior. So what we're now finding is if we lower cholesterol levels, we're finding actual mental changes. The study was done on men, but we're finding that. So the trend for prescribing statin drugs is concerning and is particularly relevant in diabetics. 
Diabetics is part of the protocol for diabetics, and a diabetic's underlying disease increases the risk of heart attacks. Diabetes, we know, does that. So they put you on a statin as one of the four protocols for diabetes, because if diabetes is going to raise your risk of a heart attack, we're going to put you on the statin, which is the savior of the United States for heart attacks. So here are the additional side effects that could be more prevalent in people that have diabetes that actually are taking a statin also. So general uh, side effects, urinary tract infections, dizziness, partial loss of sensitivity to sensory stimuli, neuropathy, distortion of the sense of taste, amnesia, headaches. In the gastrointestinal system, they found diarrhea, indigestion, nausea, intestinal gas, constipation, abdomen discomfort, abdomen pain, vomiting, pancreatitis. In the metabolic area, they found abnormal liver functions, that's the one we talked about earlier, hyperglycemia, too much blood sugar, hepatitis, anorexia, hypoglycemia, not enough blood sugar, and weight gain. In the musculoskeletal world, we found joint pain, pain in the extremities, musculoskeletal pain, muscle spasms, myalgia, joint swelling, back pain, neck pain, muscle fatigue, muscle wasting, and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. In the cardiovascular world, they found death in up to 10% of patients because, you know, it contributes to the heart attack. But what they found was the diabetes patients not on the statins suffered less heart attacks than the ones on the statins. So that's what we just talked about here. Sorry, I didn't, uh, didn't do it. So over-prescription of statins. Rather than pointing patients in the direction of finding dietary solutions, including eating both the whites and the yolks when having eggs, and ditching processed vegetable oils in favor of healthy cooking oils, like coconut oil, olive oil, avocado oil, what, what we have to look at is diet is the only thing that's ever going to truly control our cholesterol levels, our diabetes. It's all based in this. But what Americans love about prescriptions is they don't have to modify their behavior, but they can just take a drug and that'll cover it. It doesn't. It just covers the symptoms, but it doesn't actually do this. So we're going to talk about a study that Harvard did, and this is how this stuff keeps being proliferated through the system. So Harvard Medical School recently updated an article on how to manage muscle pain from taking statins, perpetuating this cholesterol myth. So listen to what Harvard said, and this is why people believe this kind of stuff. If you're not taking a statin now, you may well be soon. These medications are commonly prescribed to lower bad LDL cholesterol and have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. We're here to show you that it actually hasn't been shown that at all, if you actually look at the actual research, but talked about by Harvard, so it must be true. They are routinely recommended for people who have cardiovascular disease, and for many people ages 40 to 75 who don't have cardiovascular disease, but have at least one risk factor. Those risk factors are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, or smoking, and a 7.5% risk or greater risk of stroke or heart attacks in the next decade. So if people have those risk factors, they have a 7.5% higher, so that means that they should be giving um, statins. So we got all these side effects from statins. It's even worse for diabetics that are on statins, and we have organizations like Harvard that are actually talking about, like this is a foregone conclusion. I mean, there's no question about this. This de de uh, decreases heart attacks and stroke and so, and Nothing could be farther from the truth if you actually look at the research. So if cholesterol isn't the cause of heart attacks, why are we having, and I'm, let's not say it, it has nothing to do with heart attacks. Okay, cholesterol is part of the picture, but it isn't the picture like we're talking about in America where this is the solution. We just have to make sure that there is no cholesterol in your body. And every animal product creates cholesterol in your body. Because all animals, including humans, are made of cholesterol. So remember at the very beginning, it's a waxy substance that's found in every cell of the body of a living animal. So there are no cholesterol in plant products, but every animal product has cholesterol in it. 
doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter whether it's an egg, milk, cheese. It doesn't matter. All animal products. So I always tell people, here's a motto. If it comes from something that has a face, it shouldn't go in your face if you're concerned about cholesterol. So let's look at what the research is actually pointing to that is causing heart attacks, which are heart disease, which is way more justified by the research than this whole cholesterol thing we've talked about for 40 or 50 years. The research that launched this low fat myth and reshaped the food industry for decades to come as saturated fat and cholesterol were rejected. Manufacturers switched to using trans fats. So, let me summarize this. So once we said, oh, cholesterol is horrible and we need to uh, redo our whole world about it, and especially our food, the company switched to using trans fats and sugars to add taste. So this term created a rise in what natural doctors have been talking about undermining every disease process in the human body for decades and decades and decades, and that is inflammation. And we're going to actually show you uh, one of the, uh, some, some uh, screencasts of the ARP bulletin, because they're now getting on the, on the bandwagon about inflammation. Up until just recently, inflammation was just this hocus pocus thing that natural doctors were talking about that didn't, there wasn't any of it wasn't true. So high cholesterol could actually lead to a longer life. This is what we're now starting to see in the research. There's a Japanese study. What they found was older people with high LDL cholesterol generally live just as long and may even outlive people with low cholesterol, uh, LDL cholesterol. While research behind this finding is still being flushed out, we still have to do some research on it, but these studies thus far have discovered a few factors that could be at play. So why could this be? Cholesterol may protect against infections and atherosclerosis. Now this is exactly opposite of what we've been hearing. The Japanese are actually suggesting that cholesterol is actually reducing and protecting the body against atherosclerotic buildup. And that's what we were told is exactly the opposite in all the studies that we've had. So remember we said earlier, cholesterol is an antioxidant. Cholesterol may protect against cancer. This is all coming from that Japanese study. Now we don't want to take it hook, hook line and sinker because we have to re do some more research on it and make sure because they use different standards for their research and stuff like that. But this is what they're potentially finding. Low cholesterol below 180, the connection with low cholesterol below 180 and violence in psychiatric patients have been linked. So again, we're talking about psychiatric patients that are prone to violence, get their cholesterol below 180 and violence rises in psychiatric patients. There's also been an association between low cholesterol and suicide dating back more than a decade. See, these are the things that you never hear. Okay. These are the ones that you never hear. So, Cholesterol in the brain, 25% of the, all the cholesterol in your entire body is found in the brain. Your brain is predominantly made out of cholesterol and fat. So the ketogenic diet that a lot, I mean, everybody knows about is a high fat diet. Well, what they're finding is when they increase the fat in the diet, people's cognitive functions become better, people become able to remember better, you know, we're having improvements in dementia and Alzheimer's by increasing fat in the diet because the brain is made of fat. So 25% of the cholesterol in the body is found in your brain. It is an antioxidant. We've said that several times. Studies have found that higher cholesterol levels are associated with better brain health and function. So now we're being told I first heard this from Dr. Gundry. He wrote uh, The Plant Paradox, but he's now recommending, and a lot of other doctors are doing this also, but he, they're now recommending that we eat an egg yolk omelet. So he's saying we should eat more egg yolks than even the egg whites, which is exactly the backwards, uh, the opposite, I guess, of what we've been taught the last 20 or 30 years. 
We've been taught get rid of the egg yolks because those are the evil part. Well, now we're finding that cognitive function in aging um, Americans, humans, uh, is getting better if we consume the yolk with the egg especially men. There's been more research done about aging men and that eating egg yolks is helping the mental uh, functions of aging people, but men for sure. So now we're being told, let's eat the egg yolks. So can you imagine what we'll know tomorrow, right? So this week, chocolate's bad for you. Next week, chocolate's good for you. This week, coffee's bad for you. Next week, chocolate, uh, coffee's good for you. So this is the problem that we have, is the rules keep changing. The problem is our primary care physicians, like we were saying earlier, it can take 20 to 30 years for that information to get back uh, or filter down or however you want to look at it to the primary care. So we still have a majority of primary cares out there that are telling people statins, you got to be on a statin. Statin is the most important thing. And here's the interesting thing. Where did statins actually come from? Statins came from a product called red yeast rice. So Pfizer, I believe it was Pfizer that created Lipitor, they built Lipitor off of red yeast rice. And then you can't patent a plant or a tree, so what Pfizer did was added a bunch of man-made stuff so they could patent it. Now, the red yeast rice that you buy at the health food store isn't gonna work. And the reason is, is the pharmaceutical companies have been instrumental in uh, removing what works from the red yeast rice. So if you go down to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, wherever, and you buy red yeast rice, it's not going to work. And they do that to poison the water. Because I have people all the time come in and I tell them, all right, well, what we'll talk about is we'll talk about getting you off your statin and getting you on red yeast rice. And what do they say? Oh, I tried that red yeast rice stuff and it doesn't work. And I always say the same thing. Try mine. And if it doesn't work, I will actually pay you back for the bottle. And why? Because we get ours from the source and we get it that it actually works. So we have people all the time that we take off of the statins and put on to red yeast rice. But you have to get red yeast rice from a reputable source who has not removed what actually works. Now we're gonna talk here in a little bit about the absorption of D3 and stuff like this. One of the things that we're gonna put in your PDF is a link, uh, it'll be a, a way to get to a link, I guess, through my website to go to, the, the, uh, to those supplement companies that we offer so that you can buy yourself the red yeast rice that actually works. Now, when I first moved back here to Tucson, we were taking people off of, off of stats and put them on red yeast rice, and I was getting calls from doctors all the time yelling at me, what are you doing? And now we've been doing it long enough and there's more doctors talking about this. There's even some medical doctors now that are perfectly okay with you trying red juice rice. Now, just like them, we wanna make sure it's working, right? So we take people's cholesterol, put you on red juice rice, say six months later, we take your cholesterol again. Cause every once in a while, we actually meet somebody that it doesn't work for. And so we don't wanna put you on something assuming it's gonna work and then it doesn't. It's very rare, but we wanna make sure that it's working for you. Most people don't care what pill they take, they just wanna control the cholesterol, right? And it's questionable whether that's even worthwhile, but if you're on a statin right now, we know statin pulls cholesterol out of your brain, we know statins pull cholesterol out of your myelin sheath, maybe causing neuropathy. And so if we could put you on something that would control your cholesterol, keep your doctor happy, but not attack your brain or your myelin sheath and your nerves, wouldn't that be a great thing? So this is another thing that we'll put in the PDFs. We'll give you an opportunity uh, on to go through me and get either, we have a supplement to actually get you to absorb di vitamin D3. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but this red use rice, we actually import the red use rice. We get it from a company that actually, we've documented that it actually works. And it's prescription, not prescription only, but doctor only recommended. Okay, so, Let's talk about something that's actually being documented huge at causing a disease. And that is iron. So a study published in 2013 found that when a person had increased amount of iron, it was linked to an increase in heart disease. 
so the iron creates an environment for oxidative stress. An excess of iron may increase your inflammation and increase your risk of heart disease. Ideal iron levels, and this is why I want you to have a, a, a pencil and a piece of paper here. Ideal iron levels for adult men and non-ministrating women is between 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. So you don't want to go below 20 nanograms and you don't want to go above 80. So there's a sweet spot. So unfortunately, the first thing people think about when they hear the term iron is anemia. Everybody thinks about iron anemia or iron deficiency, right? Not realizing that iron overload is actually a much more common problem and is far more dangerous. So the medical term for iron overload is hemochromatosis, right? And so we have too much iron and that is horrible for your health. So while your body requires sufficient iron to stay healthy, Elevated levels have been linked to cancer, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, so diseases of the neurosystem, your brain, gout, hepatitis C, liver disease, and many other health problems. So we have a myriad of health problems that are now being tied to too much iron in the body. Okay? So here's tips for keeping the iron levels uh, in check. So what do we need to do to actually keep the iron levels in check? If elevated, if your iron is elevated, the simplest and most efficient way to lower your iron levels is to donate blood. If you donate blood, you're helping somebody else who needs your blood. You are actually uh, helping, you're getting rid of blood, which actually decreases your amount of iron. And you get to find out what kind of blood you are. So the doctors will tell you what kind of blood you are, but they bill the insurance like $70 to $100 for this. And all you have to do, because we ask people all the time, what type of blood are you? And it's amazing how many people don't know that. So we need to know what type of blood we are. So one of the ways that you can do it is go to donate blood. If you go to donate blood, they're going to tell you what type of blood you have. And then you get to learn that. You get to help somebody else out. So we're helping society because there's always a shortage of blood that is needed for whatever, you know, car accidents or whatever. And so they always need blood. So donating blood can be extremely beneficial, not only to our society, but if you have excess iron, that will be extremely helpful to you. Here's another way. We got to be careful with the pots and pans we're cooking. So if you have iron pots or pans and you cook acidic foods, in those types of pots and pans, this will cause even higher levels of iron to be absorbed into your food. So cast iron, right? So we need to be careful with that kind of stuff if you have high iron, all right? Not eating processed foods such as cereals and white bread, that they are fortified with iron. So I don't know if you know this, but you know, back in the, I don't know, 40s, 50s, 30s, whatever, they took basically everything out of bread, everything that was good, right? Now we all talk about whole wheat bread, which leaves the hull. Well, most of the beneficial things are in the hull of the wheat, which gets taken off when we make white bread. So then what the manufacturers did was they had to add back in these things like iron and riboflavin. And so from a marketing perspective, what they did is they said, your food is now enriched. Well, the only reason they had to enrich it is because they took everything out of it when they made the bread. So I heard this one time, I've never tried it, but uh, I, I, I challenge you to try this. I heard, a, a, and it may be a, a wives tale, but you cannot eat a slice of Wonder Bread without drinking something with it. So just to try to eat a slice of Wonder Bread and swallow it with having no water or no, nothing to get it down, they say it's, it's impossible. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it, so processed foods, the iron used in processed foods, cereals, white bread, stuff like this is produced uh, the, in the, what they put it in the products. It's inorganic iron. So which has more in common with rust than being bioavailable, the type of iron that's in like meat. So the iron they're adding in, making it enriched, is actually not an iron 
that our body uses very well. And it's actually closer to rust than it is to the iron that we find in meat and stuff like that that we actually need. Drinking well water. If you live and you have a well, sometimes wells can be very high in iron. You should have your water checked, make sure that it isn't. How about multiple vitamins or mineral supplements? An awful lot of these have iron in them. So if you already have high iron or you're concerned about it, look at the supplements that you're taking, okay? Now, if you have iron in it, you already have high iron, we're adding to the problem. We don't wanna do that. So those are some, some um, hints, I guess, or some recommendations of way that you can control iron. Because having high iron is a huge issue for our health way more trouble with our health than cholesterol. So managing the risk of heart disease with lifestyle choices, okay? And this is what nobody's talking about. This is what the doctors are not talking about, right? I heard an article, or I, I read an article, I believe it was in the New England Journal of Medicine that said that 50% of MDs are obese. So you're not gonna get an overweight doctor talk to you about diet. Because the first thing you're going to say is, well, wait a minute here. Look at you, right? So lifestyle factors to consider for minimizing your risk of heart disease include reducing your net carbs and eliminating processed fructose. Now, it's not our purpose today is to go into fructose, but high fructose corn syrup causes amazing spikes in our insulin levels, okay? Now, why do the food manufacturers use it. Well, it's cheaper and sweeter. So it can make more profit. That's what this is about. Normalize your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Now here's something that's interesting. Omega-3 fatty acids are non-inflammatory. Omega-6 fatty acids are actually inflammatory. So are omega-9s. So the problem that we have is most Americans are not getting enough omega-3 and they're getting too much omega-6. And if inflammation is now this underlying cause, and we're gonna show you how even ARP magazine is talking about this now. We're, so where do we get omega-3s? We get them from fatty fish, such as wild Alaskan salmon. Now here's something that's important. I commercial fish in Alaska for about three years. And a lot of times the package will say, Alaskan caught. That does not mean it's wild. They have these enormous fish farms up in Alaska. And most of the fish that we get down here is raised in the fish farm, same as it is if it's raised down here. But because it says Alaskan, people assume that it was caught wild. Now, if it's actually caught wild, it will say on the package, wild caught or wild Alaskan salmon. And that is super high in omega-3s. Other things that are high in omega-3s, sardines, anchovies, fish oil, krill oil, Okay, these are things that are very high in omega-3. Now remember, omega-3 is non-inflammatory. Omega-6 is inflammatory. So too much omega-6, as is plentiful in processed vegetable oils found in processed and fried foods. So anytime you, eat, you use a vegetable oil, you're getting huge omega-6s. Anytime you use processed or fried foods, you're also getting huge amounts of omega-6, and that's gonna increase the inflammation in your body. Optimize your vitamin D levels. Now there's some research, I think in the last couple, three years, I could be wrong on that, but um, that you have to have K1 and K2 to absorb vitamin D3. So we have these people that have been on vitamin D3 for 20 years and their D3 is still low. Well, we now found out that one of the reasons is because we don't have K1 and K2, so we're not actually absorbing vitamin D3. So Designs for Health, which is a company that we really uh, promote, we really think they're one of the best supplement companies out there. They have a new pro, not, that's not really new, I guess it's been about a year, year and a half they've had this, and it's called Omega Avail. So it gives you your omega-3 fatty acids, that's what the omega stands for. So Omega Avail, with D3, K1, and K2. So they give you the D, they give you the omega-3, and they give you the K1 and K2 so you can absorb the D3. Again, along with that red yeast rice, li um, not link, but way to get it from, our, uh, from the Science for Health through us, 
we're also going to have a way that you can get this omega avail D3, K1, and K2. Because that one pill can solve two major problems. It can solve our omega-3 fatty acids, which we all need more of usually, unless you're eating sardines and, and uh, cold water fish and anchovies and stuff like that. Um, but it also gives you the D3, but it gives you the K1 and K2 so you can absorb the D3. Okay, so that will also be in the PDFs. Uh, I should have all those uploaded uh, maybe by the end of today, but we'll send you the link just like we do every time. Uh, the link to get to the PDFs and also the link to get to the replay. Okay, I tell everybody, you got to register for these things. If you don't register, you won't get the replay. So I don't know about you, but I sign up for a lot of webinars that I can never go to. They're at a time when I'm working or whatever. But I know if I sign up for them, they will send me the replay. And then I can watch the replay anytime I want. And that's what we want you to do. So even if you can't see these at the time that we give them, we're recording this thing as we do it. And then we're going to upload it. We'll send you the link if you've registered. Now, all I do is hit the little uh, thing on my computer that sends the uplink to all the people that are registered. So if you don't register, you won't get the replay. So what else can we do to reduce uh, heart disease, right? Manage your risk. Eight hours of sleep, quality sleep. And this means being asleep by 10 o'clock. Never later than 10 o'clock, okay? The secret of, of good restful sleep is being asleep at 10 o'clock. And one of our biggest enemies now is what we call blue light. And blue light comes from every uh, electronic device. So most Americans have plopped down in front of the TV and they watch the TV and usually they fall asleep watching the TV and then they wake up and stumble off to bed and go to sleep. The latest research is now showing that you need to stop all electronics a minimum of two hours before you go to sleep because blue light causes the brain to not convert serotonin into melatonin. So you can sleep for eight hours, but if you're not converting into melatonin, we're not actually healing the body. We're not getting the restful sleep that we need. So two hours before, no TV, no iPad, no computer, anything that generate any electronics, okay? I know people that have TVs in their bedroom. I know people that lay in bed and read their Kindle and their iPad and all kinds. This is just killing our sleep. There's also, I think it was about 20 or 30 years ago, Harvard did a study where they said every minute of sleep before midnight counts to the body as two minutes of sleep after midnight. So there's a benefit. The earlier you go to bed, the healthier you will be. So one of the other ways that we can do this is exercise, okay? Exercise is huge about reducing our heart disease risk, okay? So lifestyle choices are truly the secret. Here's another one. If you increase magnesium intake, okay, magnesium plays a vital role in biological function and the mitochondrial health. And the mitochondria is the energy plant. Every one of your cells has a mitochondria. And this is what builds the energy and provides the energy for the cell to do its job. So I live in Tucson and our energy plant here in Tucson is TEP, Tucson Electric and Power. If you don't live in Tucson, you don't use TEP right? Uh, I believe Sierra Vista is Colfer, Sulphur Springs Co-op, I think. But every town has its own little power plant. Well, that's the same thing for your cells. Every cell has a little power plant. Now, they're called the mitochondria. So magnesium helps the health of the mitochondria. And, um, and magnesium is a culprit in the develop, or mitochondrial health is a culprit in the development of inflammation if magnesium is low. It may also play a role, magnesium, in inhibiting the deposits of lipids and on interior walls and plaque formation. Now, that's what we're doing the statins for, is to remove the cholesterol, which causes plaque buildup, atherosclerosis. Well, now we're finding studies that are showing that magnesium actually is helping the body not build up plaque in the walls of the arterial. So a century ago, your diet provided nearly 500 milligrams of magnesium every day. Today, courtesy of the nutrient-depleted soil, you may be only getting 150 milligrams of magnesium a day. Your body flushes excess magnesium through your stool. So here's what we recommend to people. Start taking magnesium citrate 
at the level of 200 milligrams and then slowly, gradually increase until the stools become soft. And when the stools become soft, you've reached your threshold of magnesium. And then what you wanna do is back off just a little bit so the stools aren't soft anymore, and that's your level of magnesium. And we want to increase magnesium. All leafy greens have magnesium, but that's how you can do it so you don't need a doctor, right? When my stools get loose, that's too much magnesium. Back off a little bit. My stools go back to being firm. Therefore, that's the level of magnesium that I want. So the role of inflammation in cardiovascular disease. There are multiple factors affecting the inflammatory process in your body. Some are more significant over what, which you have control. Increased insulin causes increased inflammation. Unbalanced fatty acids. We talked about this a little bit before, but your body needs a balance of the omega-3s and the omega-6s. So let's show you a couple of things here. So this is the ARP bulletin, and you'll see that this is November of 2019. And they found the secret of good health and longer life. One underlying condition has been linked to dozens of serious diseases. Learn how to tame it. So this is, what, four months ago now, right? And this is the article. I just took the first little part of it, but look what they're showing. Researchers have linked inflammation to, ear, to nearly every critical disease of aging. Reduce it now, and you can clear a path for a happier, healthier, longer life. Now, like I say, the natural doctors have been talking about this for decades and decades and decades, but the medical world is finally getting on board with inflammation is underlying all health issues in, in our bodies, okay? And so let's talk about blood work real quick. I want to give people a chance to uh, ask some questions because we cover a lot of ground here. So on our blood work, there are basically three markers, major markers that show us inflammation. So the one that we get on almost every blood work is called HCRP, and that is uh, C-reactive protein. And this is one of the major markers in our, in our blood work for inflammation in our body. Now, that's really the only one that most medical doctors run. But there's two more that are super important for heart health. One is called homocysteine, and the other is called fibrinogen. Now, homocysteine is a waste product that your heart puts out all the time. So if there's more of it, we have more inflammation, more stress on the heart. So the three markers, and you, you probably won't get this run unless you ask for it. I mean, if you run your blood work through us, those are, those are automatic. We run them because we don't want to ignore blood pressure and cholesterol, but we really want to zero in on inflammation. Inflammation is the number one underlying cause of so many health problems. So CRP, homocysteine, and fibrinogen, those are the major markers that we wanna look at for inflammation, okay? Uh, we're gonna do a little video, which will probably be about 10 minutes long, uh, which we're gonna put up on our YouTube channel that will actually show, uh, one of the things we do with our functional medicine patients is urinary pH. And this can also cue us in, or clue us in, I guess, on the things that you're reacting negatively to. Because one person might not be able to get good sleep, and that affects their inflammation huge. Another person doesn't get a, a, a lot of sleep, and that doesn't seem to affect it at all. So everybody's different, and we want to find out what exactly is your reaction and your problems. Because that's the only thing that's important, is you. So lifestyle is the key for recovery, for health, for everything. So in our functional medicine program, we focus on lifestyle. Lifestyle is everything. So what is it? A healing diet. We talked a lot about magnesium and all these different types of things. Exercise. We talked about that was a way to reduce inflammation. Here's a formula. Got a piece of paper. It's 180 minus your age equals X. Then you take X and you add 5 to X and you subtract 5 from X. And that gives you your aerobic threshold. And that's where you need to be in whatever you're doing that is exercise. It doesn't matter what you do. What matters is your heart rate. So we always tell people, I don't care what you use for exercise. What I care about is that your heart rate is in that aerobic window. Now, we don't have time to talk about this. We're going to do a whole other little um, uh, web thing just about exercise and what is exercise. Sleep. We talked about that one. Be asleep by 10 o'clock. Asleep, not in bed reading at 10, asleep. And remember, the research is now showing that we should be 
stopping all electronics a minimum of two hours before we go to sleep. Meditation. We personally have kind of changed this term because for some people, meditation is a negative thing. So what we say now is stress control because there's lots of different ways you can control stress. You can control stress through medita uh, meditation, obviously, uh, yoga. Mayo Clinic did all these studies about yoga and how it reduces stress levels. How about Tai Chi? How about Qigong? I mean, I use a thing called the casino. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to control stress. But what we're actually talking about here is theta, T-H-E-T-A, brainwaves. Now, again, we don't have time to go into this, but you can look it up on Google, type in theta brainwaves. Theta brainwaves are used when we meditate or reduce stress or also when we learn things. So these are the four things that you're, and everybody knows they probably should make their lifestyle better. Everybody knows that, but yet almost nobody does it. So, you know, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, I've kind of commandeered it. And the road to heart attack, strokes, diabetes, osteoporosis, whatever, is paved with good intentions. Because people know they need to do this, but they almost never do. Lifestyle is either moving you towards health or away from health. That is it. So final questions. We have covered a lot of information. We dealt with more science than I usually do. But before we wrap up, does anyone have any questions about any of this? So in that Q&A box, let me pull this up here. In this Q&A box, if you have any questions, um, type it in here and we'll try to answer it. Now, a lot of times people don't want to put the questions in the Q&A box, which is okay. Uh, in the, the um, PDFs that we'll be uploading will also be my email address. It's just drt, D-R-T, at TucsonFunctionalMedicine.com. And if you want to ask me something specific that you don't want to put in here, go right ahead, send me an email, and we'll answer the question. But we covered a ton of ground here. Did anybody have any questions about anything that we covered before we go. We've got about five minutes left. And, um, and then this will also be uploaded. We'll give you the, the link for the replay, but this will also be uploaded onto YouTube. I'm finally figuring out how to get the YouTube done. And so we have our neuropathy talk up there. We have digestion. Next month, it is overcoming digestive challenges. And just like we did last month, in your PDF handouts will be a PDF about next month's talk. You can also go to our website, TucsonFunctionalMedicine.com, and you can go, I think it's under the, the drop-down menu of About Us. One of them is Dr. T's Teaching Schedule. And we already have all the entire year's webinars already scheduled, and they're on there. And below each one of them is a link that you can hit and register. So I always tell people, register for them. You don't have to watch them. We'll send you the relink, but register. If you don't register, you won't get the relink or the replay, not relink, the link to the replay. Okay. So questions about anything. Nobody's typed anything. So I either was a great teacher or you guys have all been so overwhelmed that uh, you don't even know the questions to ask. So the name of the game is question this cholesterol thing because the research is not showing this. Look at your iron. We need to make sure that we don't have excess iron. That is one of the biggest problems that we're seeing as doctors. And we're not really hearing anything about excess iron being so detrimental to our health, overall health and our heart health too. And then magnesium. Magnesium is one of these, it's almost showing that it is just amazing. And what it is doing as far as protecting the arteries against plaque buildup and stuff like this helps a lot of other things too. Um, and we gave you some numbers on, on uh, what your iron level should be and stuff like that. So I have two more minutes. If there's any questions, what we're, we're going to start doing, I've, I'm, I don't, <laughs> I actually don't like social media that much. So I've kind of hesitated in putting all this stuff in, but social media is the key nowadays. I mean, everybody is online. So we're putting all these webinars online, but what we're also going to start doing is putting these short little five or 10 minute webinars. So how does stress cause leaky gut? I got a big whiteboard and we're going to start doing this. I'm going to draw it all out so you can see it. We're actually going to put a video, uh, five videos, short little videos, five, 10 minutes at the most about each one of the tests that we run in functional medicine. 
And so how do we interpret them? We show you, we're going to show you the test. I'm actually going to show you what we would like it to be, what it usually is, show you basically the tests we use. Um, we have some written information on our website about it, but we're actually going to uh, put a little video. And one of my patients told me that, you know, we cover so much ground. And if we could have other ways that people could go back and review the information, whether it be in written form or video form. And so if you don't live in Tucson and you're not one of my patients, you're going to have videos. We're going to do a lot of videos about this. Okay. I ordered a couple of lights. So let me stop my screen share. We still haven't figured the lighting out. See, my lighting is still horrible, but I have lights. So by my video next month, you should be able to actually see me. So we got a camera now and a microphone now and all this stuff. I'm going to be a superstar here pretty quick. So thank you for coming. I didn't see any questions in the question box. So I guess that's wonderful. I'm the greatest teacher in the whole world. Nobody has any questions. And, uh, but look for the replay, look for the PDF handouts. We'll get all this to you within the next couple of days and look for the next month. We will give you that, uh, the, the PDF about next month, but look for next month because we'll be talking about the digestive system. All health is based in the digestive system. So our digestion and our food and all this stuff is either moving us towards health or away from health, just like we talked about with lifestyle. And so we're, we're dealing a lot with digestion. So the first two ones that we did this, this uh, year were on digestion and we want to actually, we're gonna do a couple more on digestion. We have a lot of topics coming. So I thank you for coming. I thank you for listening to me rant and rave and uh, thanks. So uh, we'll put this up. We'll send you the relink if you're, uh, so you can watch this again if you like. It'll also be up on YouTube. So I'll see you all next month.